At what point does heat become deadly? Almost 15 years ago, scientists proposed a heat limit for human survivability based on mathematical modelling. Does anyone survive if their core temperature gets to 43 degrees? But it's something like 99%, 99.9% of people can't survive. It's never been tested on people until now. What happens when you put a young, healthy, long-distance runner into deadly hot conditions? All right. Beautiful. Well, for the first time ever, scientists are using humans to test how much heat they can survive. We're trying to get a better understanding of what the potential limits for human survival will be. My turn to go in now. Wish me luck, I guess. <laughs> Fires, floods and cyclones might get all the headlines, but in Australia since 1900, extreme heat has caused more deaths than all other natural disasters combined. Because it rarely appears on death certificates, it's likely the true toll is a lot higher. And it's a global issue. A few years ago, this study found that almost half a million people are dying due to heat each year. And that number is expected to go up not down. The warmer it gets globally, we see a much higher increase in these non-survivable days. But how hot is too hot for you and me? I'm here at the Heat and Health Research Incubator at the University of Sydney. Just upstairs, scientists are using human subjects for the first time to test out this long-held theory that a wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees is deadly to humans. If you're wondering what wet bulb temperature is, I promise I'll explain in just a tick. Let's go in. Well, we're trying to get a better understanding of what the potential limits for human survival will be due to extreme heat with climate change. And there's been quite a lot of work that's been done in this space, but it's not really been underpinned by a great deal of physiological evidence. This is Dr. Jem Cheng. She's leading this experiment and is about to put the participants into a climate chamber. This is the protocol that we're working with today, so it's a pretty tight timeline, but the participants have arrived. Um, we usually start by just checking in, making sure that they've followed all of the pre-testing instructions that we ask them to do. And this here is Owen Dillon. Well, that was probably isn't very interesting footage. <laughs> <laughs> today's his third day in the climate yeah, chamber. I think today's supposed to be the worst one, so... We'll see. I might get pulled out early on this one. I don't know if that's happened yet. A little plug at the back. The idea is to test the conditions out on people who can handle it best. Young, healthy people who've had to train in hot conditions in the lead up to the experiments. They're allowed to drink as much water as they want and all they do is sit there as if they're sitting in the shade outside. And we've chosen conditions that are all different temperature humidity combinations representing 35 degrees Celsius wet bulb temperature. And we're seeing how quickly they heat up. That's, that's pretty much it. So beyond six hours in that environment, they suggest or this model suggests that you can't survive. So what is this 35 degree wet bulb temperature that they're being exposed to? It's not the same as what you'd see in a forecast. Instead, it's a measure that's trying to mimic how the human body cools itself. To understand all this, you need to know two things, how humans cool down and how the environment affects that. Firstly, we generate heat inside the body the whole time. Even when we're sitting here right now, we're generating around about 80 to 100 watts of heat, and that's equivalent to one of those old incandescent light bulbs. Um, so we're generating heat inside the body, and if we don't dissipate it to the surrounding environment, you'll store that heat inside your body and you'll progressively heat up. And eventually, if you store enough heat inside your body, your core temperature will rise to the point where it becomes potentially deadly or certainly bad for your health. When our bodies get too hot, we sweat. But it's not the sweating that cools us, it's the evaporation. When the air is dry, the sweat easily evaporates, which helps cool the body down a lot. But when it's humid, the air is already so full of moisture that it takes a lot longer for the sweat to evaporate, which means we can't cool down as much. This is why you can feel hotter on a humid day, even when the temperature is slightly lower. That process is what the wet bulb temperature is trying to copy. And the way they do that is to cover the bulb of a thermometer in a wet cloth. Wet bulb. Wet bulb. The wet cloth acts like sweaty skin, cooling off the thermometer as it evaporates. 
Put that into a real-life context, and it means the dry environments will need a much higher air temperature to get a wet bulb of 35 degrees. Take a hot, drier city like Perth, for instance. If it's a 35-degree day there, but the humidity is low, the wet bulb temperature would only be 21.9 degrees. But in Darwin, where the humidity is a lot higher, the same air temperature would be a 30 degree wet bulb temperature. Right now they're just popping on to two blood pressure cuffs, so we measure their blood. Back inside the chamber, Owen is facing the very hot, drier version. What are the conditions like in there? It's the very, it's, this is probably the hottest condition we do. So on the ends of the spectrum, we have a, a condition that's 38 degrees, 81% relative humidity. This one is 54 degrees, 26.2% relative humidity. So it's definitely that kind of scorching, hot, drier heat compared to, to the other conditions that we have. There are some ground rules to the experiment. The participants will only stay in there for three hours, and the scientists are monitoring their vitals. They'll be pulled out early if their core temperature reaches 39 degrees well before 43 degrees, which is considered deadly. Does anyone survive if their core temperature gets to 43 degrees? It's something like, um, so I don't know the exact stat, but it's something like 99%, 99.9% of people can't survive. All right, I feel like I've been sitting on the sidelines too long, so my turn to go in now. Wish me luck, I guess. <laughs> I was just in there for 30 minutes. It is like this thick heat. It, I was drenched in sweat within seconds. The only symptom I really felt, I think, was my heart beating a little bit faster just in the time that I was in there. But it was incredibly hot. I've lived in hot, humid climates. I've lived in hot, dry climates. Nothing like that. And I'm, honestly, it's actually quite frightening to think what it would be like to experience that outside of a controlled setting. While I was only in there for 30 minutes, Owen's now been in there for an hour and a half, and he's really starting to feel it. But what does Owen have? Owen's pretty similar. He's also just slight, so just a one for difficulty breathing, um, but he's also starting to feel tired and weak. Oh, breathing's fine now, but I've got four, a muscle or a stomach cramp, so a bit of cramping. After two and a half hours, Owen's core temperature hits the safety limits. He's climbing faster than her, he's just surpassed her. He was under her, below, like, his values yeah, are below he's her. Also reporting now well. Yeah, okay. He's withdrawn half an hour early. What was it like to leave the room? It's very nice to leave the room. Um, as soon as they tell you that they're taking you out, that's the best moment. Do you regret it, <laughs> signing up for this? <laughs> uh... <laughs> But how likely is it for these conditions to happen in real life? Historically, unlikely, particularly for really hot but dry environments. In Australia, for instance, the highest air temperature we've ever recorded was 50.7 degrees Celsius. But the humidity was only about 5%, making it a wet bulb temperature of just 19.9 degrees. Over the last decade, a few places near to the equator have reached the threshold, including in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. It was only momentarily surpassed, meaning it wasn't hot enough for long enough to be considered that deadly point. And researchers say in our lifetime, it's pretty unlikely we'll see those kind of wet bulb temperatures for six hours or longer. But history shows it doesn't have to be that hot for heat to be deadly. Last year, 47,000 people died in Europe due to heat. And this summer, in just one city, more than 1,300 pilgrims died during the Hajj. There's been a huge explosion of dangerous heat, particularly so in the Middle East. We saw hourly exceedances of wet bulb temperatures above 33 degrees Celsius recently during the Hajj period. So we're certainly seeing these really deadly conditions already occurring in areas that are um, tropical um, as well as very hot. And according to this study, it looks like that 35 degree wet bulb temperature might be overestimating the limit, particularly in the very hot, dry environments. For young people, it could be as low as 25.8 degrees. And for older people, 
it could be as low as 21.9. Now, under those particular conditions, those hotter, drier conditions, is no longer just the climate. It's not just humidity that's preventing your sweat from evaporating. It's your ability to produce sweat in the first place. Climate experts say in a future climate, those truer thermal limits are not only possible, they're likely, even for places like Australia. It's basically any country, any region, any city sitting in a mid-latitude belt. So we don't want to be sleepwalking into a scenario where we think that these future conditions are going to be survival when in fact they're not going to be. And so the downstream impacts of those types of consequences of mass migration on resources, employments, uh, all of these different types of um, considerations could have real quite profound impacts. So what is the heat limit for humans? The scientists we met are still working out those exact figures, but it has huge implications for the way we live and work. The people in that experiment were young and fit. All they were doing was sitting down. It was a controlled environment and they were still struggling. And for most of us, real life isn't like that. Some of us have to work outdoors. Some of us are older. Some of us don't have access to air conditioning. We know the planet is warming, but we also know there's only so much heat we can take. And the experts say, as a society, we need to think hard about how we're going to deal with that. 